Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode here at the Damage Report. Uh, you may not know, but going on in the background is a race against time. Where? Big News Wednesday is upon us. The news is bearing down. Will be we be ready, myself and my co-host. We'll have to wait and find out. But anyway, uh, thank you everybody for being here, regardless of what platform you're on. I'm uh, really glad that you're here. Um, we call this Big News Wednesdays, and indeed it very much is, both in domestic policy with the Republican Party making as clear as they possibly could who they're with and who they're not with. Um, international news, huge news there. We're gonna give you more updates on what's going on on Israel and Palestine. Uh, more terrible comments about that. We we covered a few in the uh, in the pre-show. We'll do more here, um, but I won't be doing this alone. We're gonna be joined by Jr. Jackson. Jr. How's it going? Uh, little do the people know, but barely joined by Jr. Jackson. Barely um, joined. You're here now. I, I like to you know I like to make things a little bit you know shake things up. It's a Wednesday. It's middle of the week. You got to make sure things are, are are keep you guys on your toes. <laughs> Uh, well, my I'm on my toes, but anyway, I'm seeing people are saying that the sync is off. It looks like probably oh. just on YouTube. I don't know what's causing that, but I'm sure our experts uh, will deal with it. But anyway, we've got a lot that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, not only the, the, the topics that I've already brought up, but a little bit of an update on Matt Gates and who are the most out of touch politicians in the country? Well, we've got a couple of uh, nominees for that dishonor coming up a bit later on. And by the way, as we go through all of this, you can, of course, as always, send us tweets and comments, super chats, all that, and we'll respond as we go. Uh, but with that said, Jr., and it looks like I'm, oh, it's fine now. Good, thank you. Well, I don't know who it was. Our uh, tech elves in the background uh, made it all better, so that's good. Anyway, Jr., are you ready to launch into this? We got a lot that we got to go to, and yes. apparently, we have a, uh, a a cutoff point. So um, we will uh, get to as much as we can. Uh, but why don't we start off with this? <clears throat> The Republican Party has been moving towards this for a couple of weeks now, slowly for a couple of months. Liz Cheney is now out, out of Republican leadership. And they did it in the bravest of fashions with a voice vote, <laughs> therefore avoiding recording actual votes. So they voted against Liz Cheney without even going on the record as who was voting against her. Um, and by the way, we're gonna get eventually to her speech. Um, but they didn't even hear that because all but one walked out of the chamber before her final address. So we've got some more context on this, JR, but they did it. They voted her out. They did it. I mean, it was, you know, we saw it coming. We, you know, since last week when the the, the coronation for the new by the way it hasn't happened yet, but uh, uh, Elise Stefanik is supposed to be uh, taking her spot. So this has all been in the we've seen it coming, we used to know when. Or exactly how quickly this would happen. Uh, it was supposed to be the, at some point this week. So of course they got rid of her today, um, as expected, for telling the truth about one thing. Because this is the thing: we're getting a lot of people like, "Oh, you guys are defending Liz Cheney." Not a lot of people, a couple that I, I don't even think are really being uh, a genuine in that point. You're defending Liz Cheney. I don't think anyone is defending anything Liz Cheney has said and voted on that has been perfectly in lockstep with Donald Trump. That's part of the craziness of this. Is she is a Trump style Republican as far as policy and things like that. It's just not on who won that election. That is exactly. the one thing. And by the way, they're not going after on anything else. Just that. Let's keep it real on all these things. That's so this the only is thing. about one issue. One issue or one not even issue. Well, one core psychological issue with Republicans. That's <laughs> what this is based on. It is an issue policy or an issue problem. So look, she has been knocked out. Um, they This process began months ago though, back in February, you might recall the House GOP batted down an initial effort to take her out of that role uh, for the same reason, for saying that Trump didn't win the election and the election wasn't stolen. Um, she survived that easily in a closed door secret ballot vote of 145 to 61. Her views have not changed since then, but she has been more vocal about it. And so despite the fact that we are months out from Trump's election loss, from him presiding over Georgia flipping to the Democrats, uh, the Capitol attack. Uh, they initially were like, well, no, we're not gonna like get rid of Liz Cheney just because she pointed out that he lost. Add a couple of months, and that was enough, actually. They have done some uh, lack of soul searching, <laughs> and they have decided this is who we are, this is who we're gonna be. And it's not just Liz Cheney, 
At the national and state level, Republicans who've challenged Trump on the big lie, ranging from Mitt Romney, who was shouted down as a traitor and booed, uh, all the way down to a member of the Michigan State Board of Canvassers have been formally mm-hmm. punished, publicly rebuked, stripped of their powers. Raffensperger in Georgia was literally stripped of his powers for presiding over a legitimate election because they didn't like the result of it. This is, by the way, and we've pointed this out before, we'll point it out again. This is cancel culture, if anything is cancel culture. They said and believe things that are politically incorrect from the point of view of these insane Republicans, and so they must be stripped of their positions. And most Republicans won't acknowledge this, but a few have. Senator Joni Ernst said, I feel it's okay to go ahead and express what you feel is right to express. And you know, cancel culture is cancel culture no matter how you look at it. Unfortunately, I think there are those that are trying to silence others in the party. And they have, and they will continue to. What Republican JR would point out that Trump like got destroyed in the election? Who would actually say that now? Because they know that they would lose their position. Well, the ones that are ready to retire <laughs> and the ones that sure. are preparing to leave, because that's that's the way it works. You can't, and this is this isn't nothing but a bigger illustration of that. If you're not on board with telling the lie, you should be ready to leave or be ready to be kicked out. It's just the way it works. Justin Amash did it months ago, last year. He's an independent now, partially, not even necessarily on the, of course, not the election stuff, because he was talking about Trump's lies and things he was doing while he was still in office. It's just, it's just the nature of the party. Now, from February, it's just that two month difference, three month difference now. Um, of that has been, now there's been time for folks, specifically conservatives, Republicans, to forget somewhat or, or ease their minds about what happened on January 6th so they feel more comfortable because February is a little bit too soon. And mm-hmm. number two, it's a chance for Donald Trump to jump in and inject his his brainless, not even tweets, his brainless statements now about what he thinks should happen and, core and, and endorse who he wants and talk bad about the people he doesn't want there. So that allows then the minion style Republicans who are only interested in power, which I'm sorry, all politicians are, only interested in power, they're thinking, I need to raise my hand and Pick me, pick me, pick me. That's why people like this, I don't know, this canvasser was kicked out. They're hoping mm-hmm. Donald Trump catches wind of their insanity and goes, I like that guy too. Oh, I like her yeah. too. Crazies. We need to shout louder that you're crazy in order to get my attention. And that's all that's been happening ever since. Yeah, yeah. Probably less likely to catch wind than pass it, but <laughs> yeah, he'll be around. And but like so much has changed over the last few months. What has Trump been doing? Like, is there renewed proof that Trump is a dynamo that's going to take the Republican Party back? No, actually, the exact opposite of that. And we'll turn to that a little bit later on. But first, Liz Cheney, immediately prior to being booted out of Republican leadership, gave one last speech that none of the people she was trying to convince of their sort of ethical duties to be normal, old school, horrendous Republicans would even hear it. (laughs) <laughs> because they walked out of the room, but we're going to pay attention to a little bit of it. Here is the first section. Today, we face a threat America has never seen before. A former president who provoked a violent attack on this Capitol in an effort to steal the election has resumed his aggressive effort to convince Americans that the election was stolen from him. He risks inciting further violence. Millions of Americans have been misled by the former president. They have heard only his words, but not the truth, as he continues to undermine our democratic process, sowing seeds of doubt about whether democracy really works at all. The election is over. That is the rule of law. That is our constitutional process. Those who refuse to accept the rulings of our courts are at war with the Constitution. Okay, so she is uh, awful and a monster, but there she's just stating facts. That's all <laughs> that she's doing. And yet, because she's stating facts that are inconvenient to them cognitively, uh, they trust the, the sentient pillow guy way more. The guy who says that like Trump's gonna become president in October or whatever. They, they trust that BS more um, than her just saying, by the way, all these judges, Trump judges, they, they said that there was nothing to what he was saying. Like, and you can't just overturn an election because you don't like it. That's all she's saying right there, JR. That's all, that's, that's all she's saying and that's all anyone else has ever said. But those are now democratic lib talking points. That's, mm-hmm. what, that's the line that's being run from people um, that are from outside groups that are part of this to people that are with, right within it, the very people who voted her out. That's just the problem. She's too busy 
throwing out Republican, I'm sorry, Democratic talking points, which are the elections over, Donald Trump lost. It was not stolen. That's that's the yep. Democratic talking points now. So now Democratic talk points are also the sky is blue, <laughs> uh, the water is wet, and the sun is hot. That's a that's Democratic talking points now. And then if if you don't, and by the way, I actually threw in the sun is hot. That's actually one of the things the Democrats, I mean, the Republicans generally don't like to agree with anyway. You know, <laughs> hey, by the way, the whole climate change thing is a is actually mm-hmm. a fraud and a hoax and fake. Everything that they don't know that that is politically inconvenient for them to accept is just a lie. Mm-hmm. And move on, kick anyone out that says the opposite. That's just the way we. That's that's where we've gotten now. And there's enough people in the country that are buying yeah. into it that it allows them to keep pushing it. Yeah, and like it, the the whole country is all like terrified about cancel culture, or whatever. Like I, I find this more worrying. This like the development of these incredibly dogmatic, aspirational, tell me what I want to hear cults, which like. Okay, when it's an entire political party, that's the scariest form. But there's tons of these in the media. People who believe these insane things and just want to hear it over and over again and react like viciously when their bubbles are burst. And that is the Republican base. And because it's the Republican base, it's the Republican party as well. Anybody who wants to remain as a politician, like if you speak out against it now, you're probably gonna be kicked out. By the way, she's kicked out of her position. Like they didn't want to censure Marjorie Green for mm-hmm. saying Pelosi should be shot in the head, among other things. Matt Gates, for all of the, the what's been revealed about him, or at least alleged, doesn't bother them at all. Madison Cawthorn, I mean, he lied about being left to die in his accident. He lied about going to the Naval Academy. He lied about training for the Special Olympics. All these lies. Oh, and then also all the sexual harassment allegations. No, that doesn't bother them at all. But Liz Cheney said Biden won. Biden's in the White House. Like it seems like a not that inconsequential of a lie from your point of view when Biden is definitely president. But anyway, Liz Cheney continued in her final remarks as a member of Republican leadership. Let's take a look at that now. Our duty is clear. Every one of us who has sworn the oath must act to prevent the unraveling of our democracy. This is not about policy. This is not about partisanship. This is about our duty as Americans. Remaining silent and ignoring the lie emboldens the liar. I will not participate in that. I will not sit back and watch in silence while others lead our party down a path that abandons the rule of law and joins the former president's crusade to undermine our democracy. We must speak the truth. Our election was not stolen and America has not failed. I mean, America, (laughs) but I I take your general point, Liz Cheney. Uh, Jared, what do you think? Well, yeah, uh, okay. So she's gonna get, I'm I'm not sure what's next for her, honestly. So uh, the point is, you know, we have to tell the truth, but sadly, so this is where I may go and tilt the other way. This is the natural result of Decades and decades of Republican, of normal, what we see is normal Republican Party lies. So if you've conditioned your followers and your voters to believe all the things that you say that they've always lied about, you know, from the economy to society to uh, to who's siphoning the money, all these types of things to who's getting the tax breaks to where the jobs are coming from, all that stuff that they've been lying about from terrorism to all that stuff, that leads to a more and more insane version of a new lie. So when we got to this large enough lie that the election was stolen, when it's 100% obvious that it was not, honestly, yeah. folks like Liz Cheney shouldn't be too surprised. You've been on board with them pushing these lies about everything else, completely flipping reality on its head until about everything else. And then we get to this and you can't really be surprised that the folks that you've been lying to and convincing that reality isn't really it are suddenly buying the biggest one of, of yet. Yeah. Who knows what's next? It can only get bigger because now enough people are not pushing back on it. Maybe you have like 25% of the party pushing back on it. It's not enough. It's just not enough. And you've been a part of building up to this point now. So totally. I, and I don't expect this to happen, but it should at least be mentioned. Hey, we've been lying for decades and look where we are now. I kind of regret that I took part in it because now I'm getting kicked out of my leadership position for finally standing up to the first lie. Yep. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. Um, She's not acknowledging, as far as I've seen, 
any of her own issues, obviously. Um, which is worth noting. Um, you're, yeah, you're right. Uh, they've trained their uh, their base to believe ever increasingly convenient lies. But then also there's the layer of like she's she's doing this speech that I guess is like it appeals to me. It's like truth matters, reality matters. We should believe things that are true. Yeah, I agree with that. They don't like. It's not that. It's not that they really fundamentally believe that the election was stolen, like an actual belief. That's not what it is. They want Trump to be president and they don't care. Like she's trying to convince them that, wait, hold up. This is bad for democracy and we have an ethical commitment to our democracy. They don't care about that. They really don't. Like, I talk about the commitment to democracy and it being important and you know us wanting to make it easier to vote and increase participation, all of that. But I also understand that we're broadcasting to people that are in theory interested in that stuff. Their base isn't, they consider and probably rightfully so democracy as a massive obstacle to continued white supremacist rule via Republicans in America. That's just the truth. They would love democracy if it produced unending Republican rule. But if it's not going to, they don't care. They're not interested in Trump winning by getting the most votes. They just want him to win. They're not interested in the Senate being ruled by Republicans who were chosen by the majority of America. They don't care about that. They just want Republicans in office, that's it. And if all of those other manipulations of the system produce an extreme right wing Supreme Court that's fundamentally not democratic or representative of what the American people actually think, they don't care about that. It's not a party interested in democracy. It is a party willing to sort of ostensibly in a shallow level engage with democracy and manipulate it and constrain it and throw up roadblocks wherever necessary to gain power and then use that power. That's it. And I feel like while I'm glad that she's pointing out all the lies and everything. She doesn't seem to fundamentally get how opposed to democracy, the turn against democracy that we've seen amongst American conservatives. I don't know how, well, I wonder if she's seen it. That, that's, that's really all. Well, maybe, okay, they, they, don't, they don't necessarily see it, but they also didn't expect it to get to this point. Somehow, there's always a surprise moment for these folks who are the closest to the to all of these talking points and these lies go and they go, I have no idea how we got here. And they, I think they genuinely wonder how we got here. And they think they're just playing games. These politicians, they understand the power they have, then they don't understand the power they have somehow. They're like, we're pushing the narrative, and we're pushing American people to be in a certain place and, and enacting uh, 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 policies that destroy mm -hmm. the country. But then once the country is on the brink of destruction, as we saw on January 6th, they're like, oh my God, how could this happen? You know who else said that? Kevin McCarthy who's not kissing Trump's ass all over yep. again. So that's Only who said, said the same thing that Liz Cheney said after January 6th. Let's not forget that part because he wants us to because that's the way these things work. You just flow with the wind of it and now the wind happens to be Trump's wind that they're caught up in the back of that they're enjoying. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Donald Trump 
is the champion. Not politically, he lost so, so much, but he is the leader of the out of power and probably like to stay that way, the Republican Party, because Liz Cheney has been voted out. And he is ready to declare victory. And in what form? Well, from his tiny desk. So here's a little bit of what he's been saying about the effort to get rid of Liz Cheney. He said, the Republicans in the House of Representatives have a great opportunity today to rid themselves of a poor leader, a major Democrat talking point, a warmonger, and a person with absolutely no personality or heart. As a representative of the great state of Wyoming, Liz Cheney is bad for our country and bad for herself. What does that mean? What, what does that mean? Why is she bad for herself? <laughs> um, almost everyone in the Republican Party, including 90% of Wyoming, looks forward to her ouster, and that includes me. Oh, well, thank you for clarifying that. I thought you were her biggest fan up until then. <laughs> um, but yeah, she's bad for herself. She's also a bitter, horrible human being. I watched her yesterday and realized how bad she is for the Republican Party. She has no personality or anything good having to do with politics or our country. <laughs> So he realized yesterday, yesterday. He bad. He liked her <laughs> up until then, I guess. <laughs> You've got like 180 characters and you can't put together a couple of rational thoughts. <laughs> well, I let's like run Monday, Tuesday morning, <laughs> still good. Around noonish, ooh, no personality, no heart. You're bad for yourself. You're basic. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how anyone reads this and goes, yeah, like man, boy, can you? There's a reason why people always point out who wrote the tweets and who wrote what speech versus who didn't. It's always, always glaringly obvious whenever he is. There, it always leads to a point where you're like, what? And then you get back on track and you go, wait, where are we again? Oh, that's another dumb point. Wait, what does that word mean? <laughs> It's always something where you're looking for reasons why he went this route. And then after writing it, press that send button. Yeah, I, I, but, man. Dude, he is like, he is basically just a ball of filet fish and projection. And here it's really heavy on the projection because she's bitter and horrible. Dude, you're so bitter, you're so bitter. And like, it's not the worst thing in the world. Lots of people are bitter. I'm increasingly bitter, but you're definitely bitter about how much of a loser you've been recently. So <laughs> to attack her is bitter, come on. Now, um, that said, he's declaring victory. There are some others who are declaring victory, um, although not always in a way that reflects well on them. So um, you had Madison Cawthorn did that na 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 thing in like a long tweet in what I assume he thought was like cool, it wasn't. But even that wasn't the worst. So um, Jake Sherman had tweeted news, Cheney removed from her post by voice vote, to which Matt Rosendale, Republican representative, put up the mission accomplished image. I'm and sorry, I, Matt, Matt Rosendale is, is he's not- He's a Republican, oh, he voted I, to get rid of her. Bro, I didn't look deep into Matt Rosendale at all. And I said, "Oh, look at this lib talking trash about, <laughs> about what they just did. I, <laughs> I'm fairly certain I looked it up. No, he's, uh, we're gonna confirm representing state of, uh, no, 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 he's a Republican. Yeah, no, he put the mission accomplished thing. Cause he's like, yeah, remember when we accomplished our mission and everything <laughs> went well and it wasn't a disaster for us or a party at all. Do you not, that mission accomplished thing is a meme because of how much of a self own it was. And also known of our country, unfortunately. And there, as it turns out, it was bad for everyone. What an idiot! What a idiot! Oh my God! No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm no. This whole time, I've been trying to think of a worse self-owned tweet you could have. I was like, I was trying to think of every other meme or gif that he could have posted that would have been worse. That's more ironic. That's more of the an onion article would have posted or something about, or just mm -hmm. you know, just just one of those elitist libs that like to talk about this always attacking us for no reason. That's what a, that's what everyone else would tweet. This well, is a part are, of the pushback. This is like a thing on the right though, because there are a couple of other examples of this. So um, was it Brad Parscale? He did, he called their operation the Death Star, which notably was destroyed <laughs> several times and then the campaign lost. So that's weird. Or the time that they put together that video from Marvel where Trump was Thanos, like immediately before losing. <laughs> but but they, they, they think that it's, they think that it's like clever, it's like, yeah, we're gonna put that up there, and then they're gonna like say that we're wrong, but that's us owning them. 
It's, it's like they it's never not. watched. Why not just be clever? They never watched the end of the movie. I mean, yes. they also, it's, it's why the they're the also war. still Confederates. You lost. It's why they're also still Nazis. The Nazis were the worst people in history in, our, in, in the general broad sense of everyone in the world. But you still call yourself Nazis and Confederates. You guys were the worst. Now apparently mission accomplished is a positive thing. When we went into yeah. Iraq and weren't supposed to, had nothing to do with it. But that's that's the Republican Party, except all of the worst things you do, because that's just who you are. And if you don't mm-hmm. accept it, get the hell out. If you don't, I'm sorry, the last thing is you lost your Confederate, you lost your Nazis, and you lost because you're Donald Trump. Three of the mm-hmm. biggest losers, you're backing and coordinating your entire political principles behind. Backing a loser, cool strategy. Actually, we have a little bit more on that, so I'm glad that you transitioned to that. Uh, the Republican the Republican Party has chosen Trump over Cheney or Trump over the truth. Truth Cheney isn't really important, but she's a stand in for acknowledging their issues and potentially growing. And here is the issue with that strategy. It's not just that Trump is awful or whatever, they're fine with that. It's that electorally, it seems like a pretty dicey decision for their party to have made. And I want to turn you to a little bit of their own internal polling as evidence for that. And the uncomfortable like sensation that they seem to get. They're not saying it, but it's pretty clear. So apparently, this is back in April, when staff from the NRCC rose at this meeting to explain the party's latest polling in core battleground districts. They left out a key finding about Trump's weakness, declining to divulge the information even when directly questioned about Trump's support by a member of Congress. Here's what that information was that they did not bring up. Trump's unfavorable ratings were 15 points higher than his favorable ones in core battleground districts. Nearly twice as many voters had a strongly unfavorable view of the former president as had a strongly favorable one. So Liz Cheney, this is one of the things that apparently scared her according to her. She said that she was alarmed in part because Republican campaign officials had also left out how bad Trump was polling back in a March retreat for ranking committee chairs. Both instances she concluded demonstrated that party leadership was willing to hide information from their own members to avoid the truth about Trump and the possible damage he could do to Republican House members. So this, I don't look, it is possible that he's polling really bad, but that's still better than whatever else we have, maybe. But they're pitching this as he's the one that will help us build back better. And he's doing terribly in the polls. And they know that, they've got the polls, but they're hiding it even in their internal discussions from each other. They don't seem, JR, to want to acknowledge that people hate him. That's leadership, that's Republican leadership, that's that's what they want. They want <clears throat> Republican leadership that will follow him to the ends of the earth and not look at the reality in front of themselves. They have to be children, this is how cults, this is how Minions work. You can't have your own voice. You can't see the obvious right in front of you and point it out, or else you are not a part of this. They keep saying Liz Cheney is not a leadership type of person because she continues to say things that are out of step with the rest of the party. The rest of the party just told you that they don't like well the the people who are supposed to, you're supposed to listen to in the party told you they don't like Donald Trump. You ignore that fact and then go with this leadership position of continuing to follow the guy that no one likes, and you still think. This is a winning strategy. Hey, Republicans before Trump got in office said all the all these correct things like Lindsey Graham. If we accept Donald Trump and ingest him into our party like this, it will be the end of us. He said that because no one likes him. They knew that, but now that he won, that eliminates everything. He yeah. Now that he won once, that eliminates everything for the rest of time. Follow him to the ends of the earth. I don't care what the people say. I don't care that he just lost an election. Let's yeah. keep saying he won it. Okay, there are there are two more little tiny aspects of this I want to make sure that we cover. Uh, so Liz Cheney has been uh, booted out of Republican leadership. So who is going to replace her? Well, the obvious answer seems to be the person who's been talked about for a couple of weeks while they've been prepping for this, and that is uh, Elise Stefanik. Now she has now made her formal bid to replace Cheney as the House GOP's number three leader. So she is she's going whole hog for that thing. Um, now, bear in mind, in the past, she used to be really critical of Donald Trump, pointing out that he was misogynistic, xenophobic, all that bad stuff. And then she decided, oh, wait, I want a career. And so she changed, <laughs> uh, which makes her a good Republican. Just change in whatever way is necessary for Donald Trump on any given day. But is she actually going to be the leader? Because there are a couple of signs, crazy signs from crazy people, that others might be trying to challenge her for that. So 
I saw this tweet from, and I apologize in advance, Marjorie Green, who said, I voted a second time to remove Liz Cheney as the chair of the GOP. And I stand alongside 74 million plus, at least they're saying 74 now, they're no longer saying 75, thankfully. Uh, Trump supporters in opposing Cheney's Trump derangement syndrome. Hold on, let's pause for one second there. Because JR, Cheney's the one who is <sighs> deranged when it comes to Trump. Not that an entire political party has been stopped in his tracks by a need to bow down and agree to whatever lie Trump says or be booted from the party. Cheney's got derangement <laughs> syndrome. That's pretty good. People say Republicans can't be funny, but. I'll let you finish that tweet. Sure, sure, okay. Uh, I've also asked GOP leader to delay the replacement vote. There should be choices, not predetermination. Mm. Ooh, bow, 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 drums. So mm. predetermination obviously means Stefanik, because she was the one that everyone's talking about. So JR, what is she hinting at there? <laughs> She's hinting at, hey, Donald, I'm not Donald. Hey, Kevin <laughs> McCarthy. <laughs> I'm the Trump that's in that's in uh, in the house now. I should replace her. Can't you see? Trump loves me. It'll help you get the leadership position. That's because that's obviously all that Kevin McCarthy is vying for. That's why he did the whole switch, ran up to Mar-a-Lago, kissed the ring, and came back and started preaching a different story. So now that that's happened, Marjorie Taylor Greene is like, wait a second, you let me off hook for all the horrible things I was doing. Mm-hmm. Back me, stood stood up, stood up behind me after you wanted to say I'm a horrible human being. Let's finish this off. I thought we had a partnership, bro. That's yeah. all she's saying. Because listen, once you get a bunch of thieves that just robbed the bank and they get into the hideout and they spill all the money on the table, I think one of them is going to be like trying to sneak a couple extra hundred dollar bills in his pocket as you guys decide, uh, mm-hmm. start to divide it. That's what thieves do. Thieves don't care about other thieves. They're just trying to get their money. And that's yep. what Marjorie Taylor Greene is looking to do right now. And look, obviously, it seems like, well, choosing the wild card of the crew as your leader is crazy because, first of all, she has no seniority, she has no experience. She literally isn't allowed in committee rooms. Like, she cannot work effectively. But that does mean she has a lot of time to campaign for the position, I suppose, because she literally can't work. They're not in power, and she can't go in the committee rooms. So, why would you choose her except that she's very loyal to Trump? Trump seems to like her, and she's she is the future of the Republican Party. Let's keep it real; yeah. it is as crazy as she is, and may, maybe crazier. Maybe it'll someone, be crazier than Marjorie Greene. Someone has to be the heir apparent because Donald Trump, I hate to say this, isn't gonna live forever. He's an old man, so mm-hmm. you need someone to carry the mantle. You need someone that's gonna get that's gonna get the torch passed along to them. And some of these folks are vying for positions. And you you mentioned her lack of qualifications, the fact that she has no experience, that she doesn't know what she's doing, that she walks into a room and she stumbles and, and her face hits the podium. All those things happen. <laughs> and who is that? That's mm-hmm. Donald Trump, that's her qualification. That's true. Donald Trump came in with zero experience, boasting of all these accomplishments that don't exist, telling everyone what he's gonna do when he can't do them. And he walks in and everyone goes, oh yeah, okay, that's right. I'm sorry, I yeah. forgot about the misogyny and, and the racism, that helped too. So that's she's true. like, I'm Trump, look, I don't know anything either. <laughs> it's perfect. I Look, I maybe it's, maybe it's her, I would like to throw out one other name. I would say you have this opening in leadership, have you considered Young blood. So why not choose someone who is literally always looking for young blood? Just make it Matt Gates. Why not? <laughs> oh, Just no. bring him in. I mean, he's not really working either. <laughs> and he likes Trump and Trump <laughs> likes him. Mm. He'll have he'll have a couple of charges potentially coming. All that matches is great. Exactly. It'll be it'll be exciting stuff. Okay, now with that, really fast, let's jump into this. Okay. So Liz Cheney is out. Okay, and look, a lot of people have been speaking out in support of her in some form. I mean, we're effectively doing that when pointing out that she at least acknowledges certain truths that the Republican Party is turning from. But, and we've acknowledged this from the beginning, JR did earlier in the show, that does not mean that she's awesome. We can have a little bit of nuance. And so I wanna point out some of that nuance that's been provided recently by Representative Ilhan Omar, who had this to say, Liz Cheney is as right wing as they come. She has spent her career agitating for war with Iran, is an open climate denier and has pressured the government to silence climate activism. She has supported giant tax breaks for billionaires, gutting healthcare in this country, and is one of the most prominent agitators for endless wars and impunity for human rights abusers. She has repeatedly singled out Muslims for scorn, 
and directly contributed to the rise of anti-Muslim hate in this country. Progressives should not be celebrating anyone with her record. But she says it's also true that the reason Republicans are removing her leadership is shameful. They support the violent insurrection to overthrow our election on January 6th and will purge anyone who calls for accountability, even if they support a radical right wing agenda. They will cancel and censure if you dare to challenge them, but cry if anyone calls them into account. We should all fear for our democracy. I think that those two statements put together is how everyone should view this situation. She's horrible. She's just better than the others on this particular issue. Still horrible, but better on this issue. And the Republicans ejecting her just because she's awful, it doesn't mean them getting rid of her is a good thing. And it doesn't signal good things for the future of American democracy. I think that the representative is 100% right there, JR. Yeah, it's one of those things you have to clarify because then next thing you know, of course, the story can get twisted very easily. And you're gonna see all these folks, Democrat elected officials, libs even, just or pundits to talk about the ridiculousness of this vote, this voice vote where no one is held to actually has to put their name to their vote. After people point out the ridiculousness of sending Liz Cheney away off of this, based off of this. So this clarification has to be made because you know they're gonna be like, oh, now look at the support that Liz Cheney's getting from libs all over the country. And you know, then look at, the, is this galvanizing her support for president? You know, all these things are gonna start mm -hmm. getting floated because they're gonna uh. say she got ousted from the party. And she's gonna run as an old school Republican and she's coalesced some support from Democrats, which she hasn't. Just because people are saying <laughs> how ridiculous this is that the Republican Party is kicking her out. Hey, I'm not crying for Liz Cheney. Like I said earlier, she's part of the party that helped develop this entire narrative that up that every that upside down is right side up. That's just the way they've always done, and she's been a part of that. Yeah. So she's a victim of her of her own doing. It's just we can still point out how ridiculous it is that they've gone this route based off of this specific thing about the election everyone watched. Totally, it just wasn't what it was. Exactly, exactly. And and I and I think generally that context has mostly been there. There's this like, there's this idea that tons of people are like she's the best. I I haven't really seen that. Maybe it exists. And to be fair, I don't really watch the mainstream media. That that is one area, by the way, that I will agree with. Um, Trump's recent scrawlings at his tiny desk is that he said about Liz Cheney, I look forward to her being a contributor at CNN or MSDNC. <laughs> and he's not necessarily wrong. Like, exactly, actually. Mm, he sucks. <laughs> not necessarily wrong there. And by the way, and by the way wrong everything now, else. If I worked, if I worked with Liz Cheney, I would tell her start reaching out to those Democrats that are that are uh, that are talking about how bad it was what happened to you. Because yeah. I'm telling you, man, these establishment Democrats, some of them aren't that far off from like the moderate Republicans. Got to be honest. Look, Adam Kinzinger is going to benefit from this. Adam Kinzinger is going off about all this. He's going after Matt Gates. He's going after Donald Trump. He's going after the leadership. He's going after everybody, yeah. and he's saying it with with like with no uncertain terms. And I don't know if he said he's not running again or is that the normal thing that happens to Republicans when they speak out. But he's going to benefit from this as well. And that's one of those things. If you want to try it, it's just people who see the whole picture like we do aren't going to go for it. But you know, exactly. you can try. Exactly. We want to keep keep you updated on what's going on in Israel Palestine. It has gotten even worse as predicted, but man, it really hope that we could avoid some of this. The death toll in Gaza has risen to 48 Palestinians, including 14 children and three women, according to their health ministry. More than 300 people have been wounded, including 86 children and 39 women. And wounded can mean some really bad stuff. That has so many children in those two categories. Now, additionally, six Israelis, including a soldier, three women and a child were killed and dozens of people were wounded. So uh, the violence has continued incredibly disproportionately, surprising literally no one. Um, but additionally, the form of the violence, the sorts of buildings that have been targeted has thankfully generated a lot of international discussion about these tactics. Not new tactics, by the way, in past sets of airstrikes, um, in Gaza, we've seen things like this, but I want to talk about one particular instance. This is a high rise apartment building in a densely populated Gaza city that was uh, destroyed intentionally. It was specifically targeted, and I believe we have some footage of it actually happening. So that was, I'm reading the tallest structure in that city. 
Uh, the people in it were warned to get out and it was destroyed. Why? It was the tall structure in, in the city. And it really sends a signal, it really sends a message to the people there that you can destroy it and probably get away without any consequences whatsoever. The structure, by the way, housed residential apartments, medical production companies, and a dental clinic. There's no immediate word of casualties. Within 15 minutes of its destruction, the armed resistance wing of Islamic Jihad announced it would retaliate with rockets aimed at Tel Aviv. Hamas said it fired more than 130 into Israel after the attack. Indiscriminate rocket attacks against civilian areas areas are also considered war crimes under international law and more discriminate or indiscriminate, I should say. We don't know who might have been injured or killed as a result of that. Um, but we do know a little bit about the view inside of some of the power structures in Israel of the destroying of that particular building. This is a meme that was posted by IDF online. And uh, the translation is before and after. So a lot of people suffering in the area, a lot of people just devastated by what they're seeing internationally. But some people are having fun with it, JR. Some people enjoy what's happening. It's it's always going to be that way. So um, obviously, this these types of conflicts are as bold as anyone can remember, right? And we we get new versions of them, however many years or months in between each of them. Um, but to this level, apparently, has been this big, or this potentially is where it could go, since like you know since what 2014, I believe they said. But um, it's 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 hard because. We know the same thing is going to be said over and over and over again. And many of them, many folks on no matter which part of this knows that, especially us over here, aren't looking at this and seeing exactly what's happening and how it's happening, when it's happening, what triggered it and which folks got shoved out this time and then what their circumstance was and then what their immediate response was. And if these rockets coming over from Gaza then were in response to and in what way and what targets they hit. but. The one thing we always do know after all of this is happening and these devastating attacks on both sides, there's one side that is devastatingly way more power and weaponry than another. And that's just one of those things that needs to be pointed out. So when people are getting killed and we always see the casualties and injuries are way larger on one side, you don't have to wonder why. You don't have to excuse the fact that children are being murdered or even try to insinuate that those are inaccurate accounts, which of course are which spokesperson, whose spokesperson was that that said that yesterday, decided to try to deny the fact that children are being killed here because that would look bad. This is all looking like a bad PR thing right now. And that's what they're concerned about more than they're concerned about people being killed and what they're being killed over mm-hmm. and potentially how you can stop it. The only thing that's ever said is, oh, well, you know what they're doing? They're, they got civilians and they got rockets and they got a, 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 a military equipment inside these buildings. So you bomb the whole thing, and then we're supposed to just say that's okay. Yep. And then also yeah, believe and, and, it, by the way. You know, I <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if in this particular case that that was in, was asserted, whether it was true or not. I don't even believe that they were asserting that about the, the building. They're just destroying once, buildings. They're yeah, one, they're one and person, it's not new, but they're doing it. And and sometimes you're right. They'll. Sorry, what's that? One spokesman went on. I'm sorry. One spokesman went on from with the, from the Israeli side. Went on MSNBC and had a discussion about it, and he claimed the same thing. Thing is, I predicted he was going to say that. That's how that's how much it's yeah. already it's said in the previous. I was like, well, they're going to say that there's some machinery inside of these buildings. We had to take it down, and they're hiding behind women and children. So if they're hiding behind women and children, do you shoot the women and children in the face? Is that the policy? Is that the policy that America agrees with? I mean, maybe it is. As of right maybe now, it is. And well, we're going to turn so. to that actually. <laughs> um, but but also, and there's a great thread in this. I apologize that I don't remember the name of the. It's a, a lawyer who does work in in war crimes. Um, they make these vague assertions of Hamas or other groups using human shields. That is actually a very specific thing that they're asserting. When you take hostages, you put them near your their forces so that uh, they can't be targeted. Um, these the fighters being in an urban area. Is not taking human shields. That's not what that is at all. When you cram people in a very small area, thus necessitating that if there is violence, it will be near civilians, that does not mean that you can just bomb whatever you want. That's yeah. actually not at all what that means. Anyway, you were talking about what we will do, what we will push for. So we have a little bit on that. Will the violence against Palestine stop? Well, the signs as of right now are not looking good. 
Israel's Channel 12 said Egyptian mediators were trying to broker a ceasefire agreement. However, Benny Gantz, Israel's defense minister said military operations would continue, quote, Israel is not preparing for a ceasefire. There is currently no end date for the operation. Only when we achieve complete quiet can we talk about calm. We will not listen to moral preaching against our duty to protect the citizens of Israel. Yes, citizens of Israel were very much threatened by the presence of that residential tower. And achieving complete quiet, maybe that doesn't send a shiver rising up your spine. But for me, it very much does. It's gonna be hard to have quiet when you're bombing the area. But it just means we can do whatever we want. Why would they stop? It's because there's not, this is not an actual clash, it's not an actual war. They use the terminology of war. War is between two militaries, that's not what's happening here. They can do this as much as they want. It's popular for some people domestically. It's supported internationally by your allied governments. It comes at very little cost to you. Why would they stop? Because of concerns about civilians dying, that would be great. I would love to believe that that's the truth, but there's no evidence of that. Look, look at this, a spokesperson for the Israeli army, Jonathan Conricus says he expected the fighting to intensify. Asked about a, a possible ceasefire, he said, I don't think my commanders are aware or particularly interested. Why wouldn't they be? They've got the planes, they've got the missiles and the bombs. There's literally no danger to their planes. There's literally no weapons there that could threaten the military equipment that is targeting them. So just use it. Just bomb, just send the missiles. Why would they stop, JR? You can't. And since there's no pressure from the US, why would they? Yep. You can't brag about your, your military power like we do. Uh, brag about what you can, how, how much you can decimate your opponent like we do, which Israel does as well because they're supported by us. So you can't brag about all that stuff and then talk about how much under threat and everything that you are. Sure, yeah, some of these bombs have killed and injured uh, Israelis. No, you know, I, I'm, I'm not denying that. Um, but when you point out how much, how much stronger you are than another group because of your weaponry that's backed by the largest, most powerful military in the world. You, it's 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 hard to come out as this the victim side of it. You know, America can't go into a war. We can't go over to Iraq and, and Afghanistan and fight all these wars and go, oh my God, they're firing at us. That's what it is. And if you're looking for silence before you stop firing, that means you expect to then kill their, their uh, innocent civilians. And then expect them just to sit there and accept it. You just said you don't accept the fact that they're firing bombs and, and killing you, killing some of your innocent civilians. If you don't like that and you're responding with this, the only reason you expect them not to respond the same way is because you don't feel that you're on even footing. You don't feel yeah. they're the same humans that you are. You feel that when you kill their children, they, can, they won't cry. They won't get upset, that they won't think their life is over and they don't care anymore. You feel like, if that's if that's the scenario we've we've created now, it's it's a blaring fact that you think they're less than human and that yeah. they don't deserve the same human rights that you deserve. It's just it's baked into that. That if both sides are getting getting folks killed, but only one side gets to retaliate, what's the difference between each side? Yeah. Yeah, and so as we do the show, many people know I read the comments. So I read a comment, I'm not gonna say the individual's name, but the person said, we have our own problems, let them work it out. Well, there's a fundamental disagreement between us apparently, and it is the definition of we. Because I believe that this is very much about we, and we are dying in Palestine right now. We are being wiped out, humans are we. And no, we're not gonna let them just work it out. Especially when we as Americans have been contributing to this. Our tax dollars go towards buying weapons and military technology for Israel. And that's been happening for literally decades, it continues now. It was continuing under Trump, it's continuing under Biden. We're buying the weapons that are being used there. And we Americans are stopping anything from being done diplomatically. So let's turn now to that. Uh, the United States is delaying United Nations Security Council efforts to issue a public statement on escalating tensions between Israel and the Palestinians because it could be harmful to behind the scenes efforts to end the violence, according to diplomats and a source familiar with the US strategy. Yes, that's definitely why. You have the Security Council specifically to stop military conflicts, but no, 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 you guys back out. We got this behind the scenes. I thought Jared Kushner fixed all this stuff, didn't he? <laughs> anyway. Before a further upsurge of violence, the 15 member Security Council began discussions on a draft statement that would express concern about the clashes and the, I hate that word, 
and the potential evictions, call on Israel to cease Jewish settlement activities, demolitions and evictions, and urge general restraint. Such statements have to be agreed by consensus, but diplomats said the United Nations, a close ally of Israel, told council counterparts that the body should not issue a statement at the moment. So when you get into what was actually going to be in the statement, you understand why the US had a bit, the US government had a bit more of a problem with it. It's not that it's undermining behind the scenes discussions, it's that it's pointing out the things that are leading to violence and the various forms of oppression that are being waged on the Palestinian people and the US has always stopped those sorts of statements in the UN and in the Security Council. This is not new, this is not about diplomacy. This is about protecting the Israeli government's particular actions from international condemnation. So what is the reason behind this absolute and undying, even disingenuous support for everything that these Israeli forces have been doing, John? <laughs> I mean, it's it's complicated. There's a lot of different things. It's it's domestic lobbying. It's a feeling of ideological similarity between the U.S. and Israel. It's the inertia that comes from having been allies for literally decades. It's a belief that there's some sort of geopolitical benefit to maintaining a strong relationship with Israel. It's about checking Iranian power. It's about a lot of different things. Um, very little of it, though, is about the morality of what that um, alliance uh, allows to continue. Yeah, it's and, and, and honestly, and it's it's a part of our a, a political wing of our own country that thinks, oh, if we if this level of support is what we do, it makes us holier, it makes us closer to God. It's I don't know, man. I, it, that seems like it's it's a little bit unreal and maybe an old school approach, but I still think it's baked into a lot of people's mindset without really even knowing it. Like yeah, these sure, are chosen definitely. people, right? It I don't feel like it doesn't get it's not said as much as it used to be said. Because it was done and said so much that it's just become a part of the narrative that you don't even have to say anymore. It's just if you don't back this side of it, you are against, I guess, your belief system. Yeah. Well, JR, I know that we're unfortunately gonna have to lose you right now. But you know what makes big news Wednesday even bigger? When you condense it to 60 minutes. So <laughs> thank you, JR, as always, for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, see if anything changes, anything positive in the world. Okay. I doubt it, but let's go. Um, everyone, you can follow his continuing work at Only Candies, uh, available <laughs> online. Anyway, JR, I'll talk to you soon. See you guys. <laughs> we didn't get any super chats about that today. <laughs> For some reason, the revelations about Matt Gates and the allegations he and his political allies are facing seem to pretty much only come from the Daily Beast. I don't know what that, why that is. And now I'm realizing this is actually coming from Yahoo News. I just saw it on the Daily Beast. But anyway, we do have some updates on Matt Gates and Joel Greenberg and the variety of different things that they got up to. Now let's start with Greenberg, as so many of their shared crimes apparently did. Uh, 12 women agreed to talk with the Daily Beast about their experiences with Joel Greenberg and his friends under the condition of anonymity. All of them said it was their understanding that Greenberg was paying them at least in part for sex going to as far back as 2013. Now, none of the women interviewed used the phrase sexual assault in their interviews. And the encounters seemed to cover a spectrum of experiences with some women describing platonic encounters where they still got paid. Others relayed that they had consensual sex for money. But some did characterize their experiences as a trauma. And four women said Greenberg pressured them to have sex, with one recounting that she had sex with Greenberg and another woman after being plied with, quote, an endless supply of drugs. And it is that endless supply of drugs that becomes sort of a touchstone of these stories. The woman said, I was under the influence of so many drugs, I would not have agreed to the other woman being there. I wasn't really in a position to say I didn't want to do this. I wasn't in my right mind. I was in over my head and it was kind of scary. I mean, obviously, if you are applied to so many drugs that you no longer have the cognitive ability to, uh, to consent to an instance, that is a very bad and scary thing. Um, and we do know that it's apparently a common thread, both alcohol and drugs, specifically MDMA. One woman told the Daily Beast that she's never seen so many drugs and that Greenberg regularly took ecstasy uh, during the encounters. So everything that we've said so far is basically about Joel Greenberg, and the different parties and meetups and things like that that he organized. And we know that Greenberg is facing tons of different potential crimes. But there are these connections to Gates. So on just Venmo and the Cash App, Greenberg paid more than 40 young women nearly $100,000 over the course of two years. The Daily Beast was able to connect a number of those women to Gates through Venmo, social media or mutual friends. 
but none of those women agreed to interview. So we don't have direct information from those women. And understand that the connections that they're talking about there are not necessarily all the same. So connecting the gates to these women through mutual friends, I don't know exactly what that means. That could be a connection through Greenberg, for instance. Um, connecting through Venmo, that seems potentially more damning, more direct, more likely to represent um, some form of paid you know, sexual trafficking and, and all of that stuff. Now, in terms of the effort to get direct information from these women, one woman whom Greenberg paid more than $7,000 asked a reporter twice for money in exchange for information, writing in one text, pay me or GTFO, which is at least direct. The woman was listed as a friend of Gates on Venmo, but that connection ended after the reporter contacted her. And you can read into that whatever you want, but they were connected through Venmo. Which is an area we know from past Daily Beast reporting is a way that Gates funneled money to Greenberg and the money went to the women. Whether that directly is payment for sex, whether with someone that is of age or not, we'll have to see. Now, a little bit more information. Of the two women who said that they never felt pressure to take drugs or drink alcohol, one who was a few years older than most of the other women described a brief sugar daddy relationship with Greenberg. She recalled that Greenberg paid for expensive dinners and bumped her flights up to first class. The affair ended, she said, after an alcohol and drug fueled party with several men and young women at a house belonging to a couple that is friends with Greenberg and Gates, which again, trying to be as fair as is possible. That by itself does not mean that Gates was involved with this particular woman or literally anything, but there is sort of an environment going on. That woman said of that particular party, as the party stretched into the early morning hours, she said it became clear that it was leading to group sex. She said she left shortly after one of the homeowners offered her the morning after pill from a cabinet full of plan B. You know, those cabinets full of plan B that everyone has in their house. That woman along with several others said Greenberg had floated her a job offer. So again, some of these connections are quite direct. The stuff on Venmo seems quite direct. The things that Greenberg has said to the extent that he can be trusted is quite direct about what Gates has done. The rest is a little bit more circumstantial and it just creates a context where we can believe that Gates potentially was longtime friends and hanging out with a guy like Greenberg, but never at any of these parties and didn't know about any of the crimes and certainly never took part in them. That is a weird hypothetical that could potentially be true, but it doesn't look great. And over time, every couple of weeks, the Daily Beast comes out with a little bit more information. I am assuming at some point that some of the women that have been alleged to have been directly had sex with the congressman will comment. We will have to evaluate those statements as they come in. And of course, all of us are sort of awaiting what we assume is an investigation that's ongoing very silently in the background that is not purely being conducted by the Daily Beast. But that said, does not look great for Matt Gates. In terms of the allegations, in terms of his politics, he's doing just fine. And there has been no consequences, no strike back from the Republican Party, at least as far as we can see publicly. So that's the latest and it stinks. Anyway, thank you everybody for watching this edition of Big News Wednesdays with John and JR. Had a lot of fun with it as we always do. If you'd like to see more of me, I'm gonna be joining Anna Kasparian for the second hour and the post game of the Young Turks later on. That is always fun, I expect it will be today. And you can also expect that later on after that, you can go on a trip to Wasnia. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Pacific Time at twitch.tv slash TYT, Wasnia Lambre, always fun. So definitely take a look at that later on today too. But until all of that, stay safe out there, stay sane out there, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.